Okay, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so yeah, I'm Marco Tangi, a postdoc uh, researcher at Politecnico di Milano. A uh, couple of words on my background. Basically, uh, the group research group I'm coming from, the Environmental Intelligence Lab, it actually works on uh, strategic uh, um, planning and management of uh, anthropic alteration on river system. So we are talking about like large scale development of, uh, I don't know, reservoirs, uh, accounting for multiple competing objectives. So typically energy production, flood protection, tourism, uh, even uh, I don't know, malaria prevention, something like that. Uh, and the idea behind my model was to uh, go a step further and add sediment connectivity disruption in bet uh, behind, uh, between this objective, which now then can be accounted for strategic planning and management. So uh, what is river sediment connectivity or disconnectivity? Uh, we can define it as the connected transfer of solid material between all the areas of er erosion in a river system to the areas of deposition. And we know that the natural river sediment disconnectivity is connected to the uh, well, to the health of the river system, so the ecosystem belonging to the, to the river, but also the availability of uh, ecosystem goods and services provided by, for human use. We also know that the, introducing any kind of alteration on the, uh, the river system, whether it be the construction of a reservoir, the, um, the, so directly on the river system, or also changes on the, in, on the catchment, like land use chain, deforestation, are bound to have many effects on the natural flow of sediment in the river system. And these effects, in turn, are responsible to a variety of often unpleasant effects on the river system, which are felt across uh, uh, large spatial and temporal scales. For example, loss on, uh, in the degradation of the ecosystem, uh, both on flood plains on, on, and on fluvial ecosystem, but also uh, erosion of the coast, coastal lands, landscape because of uh, sediment starvation, dam filling, uh, etc. And this is a huge problem because uh, one of the problems we have is that uh, no river, especially large river, have, uh, account, uh, are under a single type of alteration. Usually we have multiple alterations on the same river system uh, that are difficult uh, and this caused the alteration of sediment disconnectivity to be uh, to have an accumulative effect so basically it's difficult for us to understand the, the big pictures of what happened to sediment disconnectivity if we look at the single um, event or the single alteration uh, we can try to turn to models uh, to help us to un understand what happened to sediment disconnectivity but we can use it, all, but also to increase our knowledge on the river system itself. But the problem of these models is that uh, since uh, river sediment disconnectivity is such a distributed and time varying property, it should keep a wide st spatial temporal scale in order to account for the, what happened to the entire river system and all the different sources and sinks in the river system. It might also must be flexible in order to be used also in data scarce environment because uh, the majority of the alteration we found nowadays are often in a large river system where we don't have enough data to apply very complex models. It also must be able to run uh, quite fast. This is because to account for the uncertainty in modeling this kind of, mo uh, this kind of processes and also to account for the different portfolio of alteration, we need very fast, reliable models. It also must be able to determine the causes and effect of the alteration in order to, to understand why this alteration happened and uh, which, which, what is causing it. And now, if you look at the available model we have, now this is a gross simplification, but bear with me for a second. Uh, so traditional morphodynamic models, so 2D, 3D based model, are a little bit, are very good in predicting what happened in a single stretch of a system, but uh, for the scale we're working with are not very, effective considering also that it requires a lot of data. Large scale grid based models are still good and are very effective in this kind of works, but sometimes we need something that is, runs a little bit faster and with even less data. So we can turn to conceptual numerical frameworks. These are exploratory tools that trace part of the uh, information and data and the preciseness of the other two uh, categories to, in, to, to have uh, a faster, more reliable, more flexible framework. In particular, the model uh, my model is based on is the original cascade model, which is, was devised for uh, the introduction of uh, 
sediment disconnectivity as an objective for a multi, multi objective planning and management. The idea is to have a conceptual model that uh, combines the concept of graph theory and empirical sediment transport formulas to have a, at least a picture of sediment connectivity at the basin scale. Uh, the cascade model is then published, then be published as a uh, freely available toolbox. The idea behind the cascade model is to, first of all, reproduce the river system as a 1D direct graph composed by ridges and nodes. You can see it over here. Uh, the ridge is defined as the core modern unit in cascade. It is defined as a homogeneous, semi-homogeneous uh, stretch of the river system, which is characterized by a set of features which are added by the user. Then we can add the, the different value, um, different contributor of sediment and the different barriers on the river system. And then we describe the sediment transport as a combination of individual sediment transport processes called cascades, each of one traced by their provenance and carrying a specific volume of material downstream. In this way, we, all, we have information about the provenance of the material. And also, if you look at the rich scale, the quantity of the material itself. Now, uh, in my research, I went a step further by adding a dynamic component to the cascade model, uh, river system model. Uh, the idea of the, to add a dynamic component and so to move from a static representation of sediment transport and sediment connectivity to a dynamic one was to, uh, was to be, um, the idea was to be able to account for hydrological variation, but also the morphodynamic evolution of the, of the rich features of a decade of centuries, but also to be able to apply this model also for the management of uh, uh, anthropic alteration, for example, a reservoir. Uh, the, so we, uh, to do so, we nested the original cascade loop, uh, which looked for each reach and river system inside a discrete daily time loop. Of course, this also causes us to change the representation of the rich features from a static feature that doesn't change over time that what we had in the original cascade model to a dynamic feature that changes over time, both according to uh, data given by the user, but also data that we can obtain by via specific modeling components. So after initialization, the idea behind the decascade loop is first of all to, to identify the mobilized sediment by via using, using a empirical sediment transport equation. Then once we know how much material is being transported every in that particular time step, we can change the geomorphic feature accordingly if we want, if, if we have enough data to change them. And then we can deliver the sediment downstream using empirical sediment velocity equations. So here you see a simplification of what happened to inside the cascade in each time step. So here we have the, the reach number four, the color represents the provenance of the material. We have the incoming cascade, so the incoming volume. Then we calculate the transport capacity, and then we calculate a new volume that will be, will be carried downstream to the next, for the next time step. Now, this model is a very simplistic representation of sediment transport. So one idea we had is to be able to add a specific modeling component that we have called add-on component, which are components that can be that works at the rich level and are able to account for processes that are more diff that are difficult to represent in a 1D structure. Uh, the idea behind this component is still to be able to have a flexible modeling environment where if we have enough more data, we can add more complexity to the model representation. And in general, this add-on component may receive as input in each time step the, uh, data, the data that we obtain from the cascade, for example, the sediment delivery, and then you can use this data to change the morphological and hydrological features of the reaches. For example, you can imagine a 2D, 3D component that changes the width or the gradient of the channel according to the sediment erosion or the sediment deposition. Uh, here I'm presenting a case study, the first case study we applied the cascade on. The idea was to have a case study which is quite large but very well monitored in order to see if the cascade was able to represent uh, what we observed on the field. So we actually took this case study in Australia, the big, the big river case study. The, the, big, the, the big river system was characterized by a massive hydromorphological shift after European settlement in the 1850. Basically, what the European arrived in the, around the 1850, they completely cleared the land of vegetation and they channelized and drained the swamp. 
the result was, first of all, a massive channel expansion in the lower part of the river, and then a release of material from these former swamps that moved downstream as a sediment slug. So the idea was this. Uh, can we apply the cascade on this case study, apply the same drivers we observed on the, on the field with the correct uh, uh, sequence of event, and then see if the model is able to reproduce these changes? And if the first step is successful, can we then use the model to predict future changes in the river system? Now, we of course don't have daily data of water discharge for each time step for 150 years, but we can, but the bigger river system is a flood dominated river system where the majority of sediment movement happened during limited flooding events. So we decided just to simulate these flooding events where for which we have uh, extensive record of. Of course, this comes with a lot of uncertainty still, because of course we need data for the whole river basin and not a single point. So we devised four different uh, discharge scenarios, accounting for different events to cover a wide range of possible discharge condition. We also added two, two components that changes, two add on components that changes the channel width and the, um, according to the erosion of the sediment deposit. And also that account for the fact that during a particular large event, some of the flood, the flow can go over bank and so decrease the potential for a sediment erosion in the bank, in the, in the river itself. So here you see the results. On the x-axis, you see the time in years. On the y-axis, you see the sediment storage in four different reaches in the lower part of the river system. So you can see, first of all, that First, we have the erosion of the original sediment volume, which is accompanied by a massive expansion of the channel. Uh, this is model, but the point in black over here is actually, are actually field data. And then you see the arrival of the sediment slug, which is represented with a different color since in the cascade, we're able to trace the provenance of the material. We can then try to validate this result using field data, for example, sediment delivery ratio in a particular section of the river or, ex, or channel volume or the or amount of material. So we're trying to match the black line uh, with the different scenario of discharge. And you can see that the patterns that we observe on the field are closely matched by the majority of the scenario we are simulating with. Uh, then we can try to use the result to see what, happened, what will happen to our uh, case study in the future. So we devise uh, 100 scenarios of independent generated flood events without accounting for climate change for now. And we change the feature, the characteristic of the river system. So for example, we account for a scenario where uh, exotic vegetation is kept in the river system. And so the sediment slug is being kept trapped in the river or with another uh, round of deforestation in the future. And you see how the sediment delivery changes and sediment movement change over time in these two scenarios. To finish up, I want to show you a new case study, which is very different from the original Bigger River case study. It's a case study we're working now, we're trying to we're publish in this paper right now. The idea is, since now we're able, to, on the, with the case study on the Bigger River system to validate our model, we try to go a little a step further and go to a state case study, which is very different from the Bigger River system, which is the 3S River system, a tributary of the Mekong. This case study is very data scarce. We have no information at all about the sediment delivery. We have some limited information about the sediment yield in the catchment, but they're very, uh, they're very few data and very uncertain with high uncertainty. And what we're trying to do is to apply the cascade in order to have to do uh, strategic reservoir planning and management, including also uh, the use of drawdown sediment flushing to reduce the impact of sediment trapping caused by reservoir. So uh, just to show you this video over here that you will see, you will see uh, the water discharge, uh, the color in the reach will represent the amount of material transported in each time step. And here we have a situation without uh, sediment, uh, without a reservoir, and with three larger reservoirs in the uh, lower part of the river system. Now, if we start the video, uh, you will see how the sediment movement is represented in the cascade with and without the reservoir. Here we are, uh, we are in a monsonic uh, region. So you see uh, here we are going, we're approaching the dry season. So no sediment movement is being registered. 
But if we move towards a new um, monsoonic season, you will see how the sediment changes over time, especially during the first flooding events. Okay, uh, thank you for the attention. So if you have any question, please ask away. Thank you. Um, how do you account for the percent of the position you have at the dams, the, the efficiency of the dam? Okay, yeah. So on the reservoir is actually, I, I try to go as fast as, as possible in this case study is actually more complex because we, we consider in this case study over here, we also consider uh, sediment deposition inside the reservoir. We have, uh, we simply have, uh, it's actually, a little bit more complex. We represent the sediment, uh, the water storage in the reservoir as divided into different component compartment, uh, one for each uh, flooded reach. And then we have the deposition coming inside the reservoir. We change the features of the reach according of the flooded reach, for example, the width, the depth, etc. Then we use, uh, we still use empirical sediment transport equation, but since we change so much of the rich, rich feature, the, the effect will be a uh, stark deposition of the material. Then you can imagine that we do once, for example, we do sediment flushing, we completely draw down the reservoir, and then we, rest, uh, we reestablish river condition inside the reservoir, and this will, re uh, will cause sediment movement to be uh, to restart and then deliver the sediment downstream. So I don't know if I was, but if you have any question, again, I have. Uh, a lot of slide on this. Uh, I did, and I just wanted to touch on this case study because I think it was very interesting to see the potential of this model. Again, the idea is to have a very. Uh, is the idea behind the cascade is to to ask ourselves what can we do in this case study where we have no data at all, but where they are still building a lot, and can we inform at least a little bit of the decision of the decision maker accounting for sediment transport, even if we don't have data to set up more complex and um, precise models. 